Today we're going to discuss ray matrices. And before we can do that, we have to discuss rays, optical rays. So imagine we had, this is my crude drawing of a old time uh, incandescent light bulb. So imagine we have a light bulb and we turn on the current and it starts to emit light. How do we think about that? Well, in the rigorous wave theory of light, which is what we'll spend most of this course discussing, we would say that this light bulb would create electromagnetic waves. And those could be characterized by wave fronts, which would be surfaces of constant wave phase. And so we could look at the wave theory of light. But another way to think about this would be to think in terms of the flow of power. So in electromagnetic theory, we have the pointing vector, which is E cross H, the cross product of the electric field and the magnetic field. And that is, gives you the direction of power flow. So you can imagine power flow here, flowing along in the direction of the pointing vector. And of course, if I go to somewhere else in space, there'll be a different set of directions for that. But if we imagine in this entire field, just isolating a single little line of power flow, we could think about that as a light ray or an optical ray, let's just call it a light ray. Now, of course, a, a practical example of this, approximately, would be a laser pointer. You have a laser pointer, you turn it on, you get this little beam that shoots out and at least for reasonable distances appears to stay the same size and goes in a straight line. So we can think of a full field that fills up a three-dimensional volume as being able to be broken into an ultimately infinite number of little rays that show the direction of power flow. And we can imagine just having one of these rays at a time, although what we're really interested in, of course, are, are optical systems that have a complete continuous field moving through them. But this is a way for us to think or conceptualize the flow of power in the optical field. So then what we can do is we can design optical systems here. So say here are, is a Cartesian system, X and Z coordinates, and somewhere we have a lens. And of course, we we're thinking about there's some object over here, and then all these fields go through the lens and then it makes an image. How do we think about that? Well, we can think of one point on the object and one ray emitted from that point traveling in a straight line, striking the lens, and as we'll talk about today, it then gets bent or refracted and goes off in a different direction. And so at this point here, say this is Z is equal to Z1, we could think of the state of the ray as characterized by its X coordinate and its angle of propagation. And then it hits this point over here. And when it comes out of the lens, it's got some X2 theta2. And then it propagates down here and then we get an X3 theta three and so on. And if we're able to do this for an arbitrary ray, then we can use that to build up an understanding how an arbitrary optical field will propagate through this system. So this process here of following a ray through an optical system is usually called ray tracing. And we're gonna begin to learn how to do that today. So this kind of way of looking at optics is sometimes called classical optics or ray optics or what we'll call it geometrical optics. And we'll talk about the laws of geometrical optics. Or sometimes we'll just write that as GO for geometrical optics. And this is a theory that can be derived from Maxwell's equations where you assume that the wavelength of light goes to zero. But it was also known before anyone understood electromagnetic theory. It was known from exper on an experimental basis. It was an empirical theory. Um, and in particular, these three laws of geometrical optics were understood. First, you had the law of propagation. 
And that says that if you imagine an optical ray starting at some point and initially propagating at some angle, say this angle here is theta, that it will continue in a straight line till it hits something. Now this is true in what we call a simple medium. So a vacuum would be a simple medium, or more generally, any medium in which the permeability and permittivity, mu and epsilon, from electromagnetic theory, are real scalar constants. So it's a material that ha is completely homogeneous and isotropic. And in that case, rays propagate in a straight line. Then we have the phenomenon of reflection. And here, if we imagine, say, a mirror, or more generally, just any interface between two simple media, and let this dotted line be the surface normal of that flat surface. And here comes a ray in, propagating, um, we'll draw the angle this way, theta incidence. It hits that mirror and then it propagates off at an angle theta reflected. And the law of reflection is that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. We're not going to use reflection very much in this course, um, but that is the law of reflection. We're going to use propagation a lot, and then the third law, which is refraction. And refraction says... Let's suppose this vertical line is an interface between two different simple media. Here's medium one on the left and medium two on the right. And a ray comes in here at an angle theta one and strikes this interface. So some of that ray generally will be reflected and that'll follow the law of reflection, but some of it will be transmitted into the second medium or refracted and go off at a different angle. Let's call that angle theta two. And the relation between theta one and theta two is characterized by two constants, the so-called indices of refraction of these two materials, such that N1, the index of refraction of medium one, times the sine of theta one, is equal to N2, that's an N, N2 times the sine of theta two. This is called Snell's law. It's the law of refraction. And it's what we use to make lenses, as we'll talk about today. So these are the three basic laws of geometrical optics. Again, we won't make much, much use of reflection, but we will heavily make use of propagation and refraction. Now let's talk about propagation. Let's draw... 2D coordinate system here. Now, of course, in the real world, we're interested in how things behave in three dimensions. Um, but the mathematics is simpler if we just limit ourselves to two dimensions, and most of the important results can be derived just from a two-dimensional analysis. And then everything we talk about can be extended to a full three-dimensional analysis at the expense of some extra mathematical bookkeeping. So imagine we start here at a point, and it has a z-coordinate z1. And then a ray propagates off and ends up at a point with a z-coordinate z2. And the corresponding x-coordinates are x1 and x2. And if this is all a simple medium, then of course the line, uh, the path of the ray is a, is a straight line. So let's suppose the length of that path is s and the angle is theta, which is constant for a straight line. And we can imagine a unit vector u that points in the direction of that line, at the angle of that line. So over here, at the starting point, we could call that vector position r1 and the ending point vector position r2. And r1 then would be, 
what would just be the, we would just list the Z and the X coordinates. And the ending position R2, we list those Z and X coordinates. And in going from R1 to R2, we would have this equation. That R2 is equal to R1. So start at R1 and then move a distance S in the direction of the unit vector U. And that gets you to R2. So what is the unit vector U? Well, it would have, uh, its magnitude would be one and it would be characterized by this angle theta. The Z component of this direction would be the cosine of the angle. And the X component, the vertical component would be the sine. So that would be the unit vector. And of course, if you take the square of cosine plus square of sine, you get one. So it's a unit vector. So we can write, breaking out now the actual Z and X coordinates, we can say that Z2 is equal to Z1 plus S times the Z component of this, which is the cosine of theta. And for X, we'd have X2 equals X1 plus S times the X component of that unit vector, which would be the sine of theta. And that would be then a rigorous description of this line, which corresponds to the propagation of the ray. Now we could also talk about the distance traveled along the z-axis. And we're almost always going to use what we call the paraxial approximation. And paraxial means close to an axis. And that axis is going to be the z-axis. And that will be uh, in our bookkeeping here that we assume that all rays have a small angle theta. In other words, they propagate very close to this z-axis. And we'll say then that z is the so-called optical axis. Because of that, because this angle theta is small, we can use what are called uh, the small angle approximations for the trig functions. So before we do that, let's carry on with this analysis up here. Z2 is Z1 plus S cosine theta. Well, now imagine this length S here is the hypotenuse of a right triangle, and the horizontal length is this distance between Z1 and Z2. Let's call that D. So S times cosine of theta is equal to D. So we can also write this as Z2 is equal to Z1 plus D. And then down here, well, that means that D is equal to S cosine theta. So therefore, D right, is S cosine of theta. And then we can turn that around and say that S is then D over cosine theta. So plugging that in for S here, you have S times sine of theta becomes d times sine of theta over cosine theta, which is d times tangent of theta. So x2 is x1 plus d tangent of theta. And now if theta is small, we know that the tangent of theta is well approximated by just theta itself. You can just look at the Taylor series for tangent of theta, and you'll see that it's equal to theta plus a theta cubed term and so on. And if theta is small, you can neglect all those theta cubed and higher order terms. So this is called the small angle approximation. Of course, it's, it's just a mathematical approximation, not a physical one. But because we have this physical approximation, the paraxial approximation, it enables us to use the small angle approximation for the trig functions. And so with that, we'll have that Z2 is equal to Z1 plus D, that's unchanged, but now for the X equation, we have X2 is equal to X1 
plus d times and tangent theta, we, we'd replace by theta. So plus d times theta. Now, of course, we don't have to make that approximation. And if we're doing our ray tracing in a computer, well, the computer can go ahead and numerically solve equations that have trig functions in them. In other words, that are nonlinear functions of the angle theta. But to do pencil and paper analysis, that's not so convenient. So we like this small angle approximation because it gives us equations that are linear in the angle theta. All right, so theta now appears here, not as some function of theta, but just as theta times some coefficient. So for our analytical work, we're almost always going to use this small angle approximation that is, is uh, motivated by and um, is valid because of the paraxial approximation that we're assuming in our systems, the rays are all very close, propagating very close to the z-axis. Right, they, now, they, they could be high above the z-axis, but their angle of propagation is small, so they're almost parallel to the z-axis, which would have been a better way to say that. So let's define the ray state at a plane z is equal to z1 by a listing of the x-coordinate and the angle of propagation, so x1, theta1. And so if we have a picture like this, here's our optical axis z, here's the x-axis, and here is z1, and over here is z2. A ray propagates along a straight line, starts with coordinate x1 and ends with coordinate x2, and everywhere has the same angle, which we'll call theta1. Of course, over here then, theta2 is going to be that same angle because it's a straight line. So we can write that the state of the ray at the end of this line, we can think of this as the, the output and this is the input. So the output, x2 theta2 would be equal to well, x1, this is our law of propagation that we follow a straight line. x1 is, uh, x2 is x1 plus the distance traveled along the z-axis, d, times the angle theta1. And the angle theta2 is equal to the angle theta1. No change in the angle. It's a straight line. Now, and here's where we get the payoff from having made the small angle approximation so that this is a, an equation that's linear in theta and in x, we can now represent this as a matrix vector product. x2 theta2 is equal to a matrix times the vector x1 theta1. And what will be the components? Well, here you got x1 contribution to x2, so that would have a 1. Here you've got d times theta1, so this would be a d. Down here for theta2, you've got no x contribution, so that would be a 0. And then theta2 is equal to theta1, this would be a 1. So this right here, we're going to call a ray matrix, or sometimes called a ray transfer matrix, but it's just simpler to say a ray matrix. It is a matrix that tells you how the output state of the ray is in terms of the input state of the ray. So it characterizes this piece of the optical system, which in this case is just propagation in a simple me medium. And we'll see that in general, as we build up more complicated optical systems, we'll always have this relationship that the output ray state, x2 theta2, will be a 2 by 2 matrix, say with components A, B, C, and D, times the state of the input array, x1, theta1. And so that'll be a general ray matrix. Now one thing we can see over here is that if we look at the determinant of this matrix, 1, D, 0, 1, well that would be what? 1 times 1, minus 
a d times zero, and which is just equal to one. And we'll see that in general, this will be true for our optical systems um, because they will be built up of simple ray matrices that have determinant one. And because the determinant of a product of matrices is the product of the determinants, we'll see that in general, we will have that for an ABCD matrix, the determinant, which is AD minus BC, will be equal to one. So this will be a more general ray matrix. So we can have a system with 25 lenses um, and propagation in between all those lenses, and it will still collapse down to a single ray matrix with respect to describing the relation between the input and output rays uh, that are in terms of these four numbers. And in fact, there are really only three numbers that are independent because of this determinant relationship. So this really gets you um, the essence of an optical system, at least for the kind of systems that we'll be looking at, so-called centered systems, systems that are centered on an optical axis and under which we are able to make the paroxysmal approximation and then apply the small angle approximation. Now let's build up uh, a composite system. And for now, we only know how to do propagation. So this is going to be a system that is composed of two propagations, one after the other. So here are our X and Z axes. And suppose we start with a ray here at Z1. We end up First, we go to a plane Z2, and then finally to a plane Z3. The corresponding X values are X1, X2, and X3. Right? And then the vector positions would be R1, R2, and R3. And of course, they would all have the same angle theta because it's a straight line. So, Let's think about going from R1 to R3 by first going from R1 to R2 and then R2 to R3. This is just kind of to see if what we're doing makes sense. So the state of the ray at plane Z is equal to Z2 would be X2. Theta2 would be equal to, how is it related to the state at Z1? Well, we have a propagation and let's call this first distance D1 and then the second distance D2, here I'm maybe a little clearer if I put those up here, D1, D2. So we propagate a distance D1 first. So we start with our X1 theta1 ray, propagate a distance D1, and that gets us X2 theta2. Of course, what would that be equal to? Well, just multiplying out, this would be X1 plus D theta1 and theta1. Then we go from Z2 to Z3. So we would get the output then would be X3 theta3 would be, well, now here we're propagating a distance D2. So our matrix is 1, D2, 0, 1 times X2 theta2. And we could put this expression for X2 theta2 in here and work that out. Or we could see that, of course, we can just write this as a product of two matrices. So our output ray is, so the first thing we do, we take our input times this matrix and then take that whole thing times the second matrix. So over on the left, we've got the second matrix, 1, D2, 0, 1. That's for propagation of distance D2. And then we've got the first matrix here, 1, D1, 0, 1. And then that times our input ray, x1, theta1. Well, a product of two matrices is a single matrix. And let's see, what would we get? For the first element, you got this row times that column, inner, inner product. So just a 1 times 1, then 0 here. So that would be a 1. Then you've got this row, inner product with this column. So that would be 1 times d1 plus d2 times 1. So that would be d1 plus d2. Then down here, you'd have the second row, first column, inner product would be zero. And then 
second row, second column, inner product, zero times D1, one times one would be one. And of course, that is simply the matrix that describes propagation of distance D, where D is equal to the sum of the distances D1 and D2, of course, which it must, because physically that's what's going on, but this just shows that our bookkeeping makes sense, at least for propagation. Uh, we can break up one propagation into a cascade of two smaller propagations or a cascade of any number smaller propagations. So this ability to make ray matrices out of products of other ray matrices will be very, very important for us. As we mentioned before, we won't do much with reflection. But let's just point out here that if we have, say, a mirror, flat mirror, and a ray comes in at an angle theta 1, it reflects off so that the angle of reflection is also theta 1. And if you think about what would have happened if the mirror was not there, this ray would have gone on at an angle theta 1. So really what that flat mirror has done is to fold the system. So the mirror folds the system. And so you can use mirrors uh, if you're going to have an optical system which has a very, very long optical path and you want to fit it, say, on a laboratory bench, you can use mirrors to fold it. And if this is a perfectly flat mirror, the fields that come off here are completely analogous to the fields that would have propagated through free space. It's just that they've been folded over to go toward the left rather than toward the right. And so for us, that's primarily what we would be doing with mirrors. So we don't need to worry about that much. Now, of course, you can make curved mirrors like you have in reflecting telescopes. Um, in that case, you can think of the effect of a mirror as equivalent to a flat mirror and a lens that we'll talk about shortly. So a spherical lens in front of a mirror would be a model for a curved or parabolic mirror, say. Now we come to refraction. And things get more interesting here. So suppose here is our optical axis Z, here is the X axis. And here you have an interface between two media. And the medium on the left has index of refraction N1, and the medium on the right index of refraction N2. And by the way, in terms of electromagnetic theory, the index of refraction is the square root of the permeability times the permittivity divided by their free space values, mu0, zero, epsilon0. Zero. So here is the surface normal. And a ray comes in here at an angle of theta 1 and strikes at a height x1. And then that ray leaves with an angle theta 2 and a height x2, which is equal to x1, because it hasn't propagated at all. So they're right there at that point. All that changes is the angle. And that change is given by Snell's law n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. So solving for theta 2, we get a rather complicated expression. It is the inverse sine of, we'll divide by n2, so that would be n1 over n2 times the sine of theta 1. So that's a pretty messy expression. And if you're going to do rigorous uh, ray tracing in a computer, you go ahead and just let the computer calculate that. But we don't want to have to deal with that analytically. So we assume the small angle approximation, which is that the sine of theta is about equal to theta, and that's about equal to the inverse sine of theta also.
And with that, well, the sine of theta just becomes theta, and the inverse sine of this argument just becomes that argument. So with that, we get that theta 2 is approximately n1 over n2 times theta 1. You just take away the sine and the inverse sine in that approximation, and there you have it. So we want to represent that as a ray matrix. So here's our output ray, x2 theta 2. That's going to be equal to some matrix times our input ray, x1 theta 1. And what will it be? Well, x2 is equal to x1, so this is just 1, 0 there. Theta 2 doesn't depend on x1, so there's a 0 there. And theta 2 is equal to n1 over n2 times theta 1, so this becomes here n1 over n2. Now, I mentioned earlier that we're going to be looking at systems in which the determinant of the ray matrices uh, is always equal to 1. The determinant of this matrix is not 1. It's 1 times n1 over n2, or n1 over n2. That's okay, because we're not going to actually use this system. We're going to combine it with some another system such that it's going to end up giving us a ray matrix, and it'll be the ray matrix for a lens, uh, that will have unit determinant. So let's turn to that now. Now, let's throw a wrinkle into what we just did by tilting that surface. So here is index N1, and over here is index N2. And there's a line parallel to the z-axis. Here's the surface normal of that interface. And let's call this angle phi. So we've rotated, and here's also the angle phi. We've rotated the surface by an angle phi. And now when we go to look at refraction, we have a ray coming in here and then an array going out there. And here's still our angle theta 2, and this is our angle theta 1. So we want to measure our theta angles relative to the optical axis, the z-axis. But for Snell's law, we've got to measure angles relative to the surface normal of the interface. So now Snell's law reads n1 times sine of this entire angle from the ray to the surface normal, which would be theta 1 plus phi. is equal to, on the other side, n2 times the sine of this entire angle, which is theta 2 plus phi. So if we tilt the surface, in Snell's law, we have to add that tilt angle to both of the arguments of the sine function. And so if we rigorously wanted to solve for theta 2, what would it be here? Theta 2 would be, see, divide by n2, take the inverse sine, and then subtract phi. So it would be the inverse sine of n1 over n2 times the sine of theta1 plus phi and then minus phi. Okay, so that's a pretty ugly expression. Again, if we're doing this on a computer, no problem. The computer can crank through that. But if we want to do analytic work with it, there's no way we're going to be working with something like that. So we make the small angle approximation just take away the signs and the inverse sine expressions, and then this becomes approximately n1 over n2 times theta1 plus phi minus phi, which is equal to, can be written as n1 over n2 theta1 minus, and we can write the phi terms like this, n2 minus n1 over n2 times phi. Why is that? Uh, minus minus n1 over n2 is plus n1 over n2 times phi, and then minus n2 over n2 times phi is just minus phi. So that's just a different way to write that expression. Now, we're also not interested in this problem of just a flat surface that is tilted. What we really want to get to is a description of a spherical lens. And this is a lens made 
by having two surfaces, each of which is a piece of a sphere with some radius of curvature. And we'll talk about that uh, momentarily. And what we're looking at in this situation is we have a ray comes in at some angle theta one and strikes the lens at a height x1. Something happens inside the lens and then it comes out say at a height x2 and propagating at an angle theta2. And we want to relate x2 theta2 to x1 theta1. And this is a glass of index refraction n, and then outside you have air or free space with index refraction of 1. So we want to use this result to describe this system. So let's now sketch the following scenario. Here we've got a piece of a sphere. And this sphere has a radius of curvature r, which we're going to take to be positive. Well, I might, might ask, why would we ever have a negative radius of curvature? We'll get to that in a moment. But for now, r is positive. And suppose this is a point on that sphere, and this line here would be the surface normal, and here is a line parallel to our optical axis, the z-axis, and of course this now is that tilt angle phi. Um, but notice, phi will now be a function of position on this spherical surface. As we move down here closer to the optical axis, phi gets smaller. As we get higher up, phi gets larger. And that's going to be the key to the operation of a lens. So now suppose we have a ray coming in here and exiting there. So it comes here in at an angle theta 1 and exits at an angle theta 2. So this here is the height x at which those rays interface with the spherical surface. And this distance here, of course, this hypotenuse is r. And therefore, we can say that x is r, because this is the angle phi, so this is also the angle phi. So x is r times sine phi. x is r sine phi, so the sine of phi is x over r. And then phi is the inverse sine of x over r. But in the small angle approximation, sines and inverse sines and tangents and inverse tangents go away, and this is just approximately x over r. So now we write our expression uh, for theta 2 exact expression that we had on the previous board, that's the inverse sine of n1 over n2, the sine of theta1 plus phi, but phi is the inverse sine of x over r, and this is the ex exact expression, and then minus phi, which is the inverse sine of x over r. Okay, that's a big, ugly expression. Again, no problem for the computer. And in fact, we'll have a ray tracing program that goes ahead and does all these calculations on the computer. No problem. Uh, but we're not going to do that with pencil and paper. But in the small angle approximation, magically, all the signs and inverse signs go away. And theta 2 is about equal to n1 over n2 times theta 1 plus m1 over n2 times x over r. Minus x over r. Just take away all the signs and inverse signs there. And we can write that as uh, n1 over n2 theta 1. And then this x over r term we're going to rewrite as minus n2 minus n1 over n2 times x 
over r. Let's see. So the minus n2 over n2 is just minus 1 times x over r. That's this guy. And then minus minus is plus n1 over n2 x over r. So that's just a different way to do the bookkeeping for that expression. So we're going to say that theta 2 in this approximation is equal to n1 over n2. And again, this would be n1 would be on the left side of that surface, uh, and n2 would be over here on the right side of that surface. So theta 2 would be n1 over n2 times theta 1. And then we're going to write this expression as minus p over n2 times x. Okay, where p is n2 minus n1 over r. So we take the n2 minus n1 over r, and call that p, and that is going to be called the power of this surface. And for a spherical lens, we're going to combine that with the power of a back surface. This is a front surface, say. And then we'll have the power of the entire lens. And we'll see what that means. So our x2 theta2 output ray is equal to a matrix times our x1 theta1 input ray. And the x values don't change. All this, all this happens at one point. So that's just 1, 0 there. And then theta2 is equal to, let's see. Well, for its relation to theta1 is n1 over n2. So that's an n1 over n2 here. And to x, it's minus p over n2. So minus p over n2. And here's what we can say about the power. If p is positive, well, positive power means that if we increase x, if x goes up, because of this minus sign, theta goes down. So a positive power surface is one which tends to bend the rays toward the optical axis to decrease their angle of propagation. If you were down here below the optical axis, you had negative x values, then it would go the other way. Uh, when x goes down, theta would go up, and there would still be now negative angles bending towards the optical axis. So in general, a positive power surface tends to cause rays to bend toward the optical axis. If P was negative, right, how could you get a negative surface? Well, if N2 minus N1 was negative, in other words, if, if this index was smaller than that index, then you'd have the opposite. Increasing X would increase theta. So then the lens would tend to bend rays away from the optical axis. So now, let's imagine a spherical surface that's bent in the other direction, or curves in the opposite direction. So in this case, the center of curvature would be to the left of the surface. So this will be R, and we're going to use the bookkeeping um, convention that if the center of curvature is to the left of the surface, that we say that's a negative radius of curvature. We'll see why that's very useful for us. Okay, so now let me move this down here, actually, or less than zero. And so we do our same bookkeeping tricks here. So in this case now, here's our angle phi. There's our angle phi, it's bent in the opposite direction. And, and so a, an angle which corresponds to a rotation that is clockwise will be a negative angle. Counterclockwise rotation is positive angle. So there's phi. And now here comes in a ray, say. I didn't like that very well. Here comes in a ray. And it's got an angle here, which is theta 1. And it comes off at an angle theta 2. So this is phi, and that's phi. And again, that height is x. And once again, we get that theta 
is equal to the inverse sine, uh, I'm sorry, phi is equal to the inverse sine of x over r. But in this case, because r is negative, the inverse sine of a negative number will be negative, and so this will be a negative angle. So this is just our convention that angles that correspond to counterclockwise rotation are positive, and uh, in the opposite direction, they're negative. So this is greater than zero for r greater than zero, which was the case we looked at on the previous board, and less than zero for r less than zero, which is the case we're looking at here. All right, so that would be then for a spherical surface that curves with a center of curvature to the left of the surface. And now we can combine those two cases that we just looked at. So now we have the first surface curves like so, and the second surface curves this way. And so here would be a positive radius R1 of curvature, and over here, a negative radius R2 of curvature for the second surface. And here we'll assume that outside the lens, the index or a fraction is one, basically air or free space, and the lens has index N. So let's look at the powers of these two surfaces, right? So what's gonna happen? A ray is gonna come in here. It's gonna bend and propagate inside the lens and then come out in some other direction. And so it's going to have strike the lens at a height x1, be traveling with an angle theta1, come out at a height x2, traveling with an th angle theta2. We want to relate x2 theta2 to x1 theta1. So the power of the first surface, P1, we already worked out that expression on the previous board. It would be the index to the right of the surface, which is n, minus the index to the left, which is 1. So n minus 1. All right, that was n2 minus n1 in our previous board. Over the radius of curvature, which is r1. And with an index or a fraction that's greater than 1, the numerator would be positive. And this is a positive radius of curvature because the center of curvature is to the right of the surface. So this would be a positive power that first surface would tend to bend rays toward the optical axis, as we've sketched out here. For the second surface, P2, we would have the index to the right of the surface, which is 1, minus the index to the left, so that would be 1 minus n, over the radius of curvature, R2. Here, because the center of curvature is to the left of the surface, R2 is negative, but n is greater than 1, so 1 minus n is also negative, so this the ratio of two negative numbers is also positive. So that surface also has positive power. It wants to bend rays toward the optical axis. The ray matrix for this first surface would be, this is what we worked out on the previous board, 1, 0, and then minus the power over the index to the right, which is n, so minus p1 over n, and then uh, the index to the left over the index to the right, which would be 1 over n. The ray matrix for the second surface, 1, 0, um, minus p2 um, over the index to the right, which is just 1. And then the ratio of the index to the left over the index to the right, which would be n over 1, which would be n. Now, if we wanted to be rigorous, we would have to take into account that inside the lens, there's a little bit of propagation. And so x2 would generally be different than x1. But we're going to make another approximation that we call the thin lens approximation. To have something to be able to sketch out here, I usually make these lenses look quite fat. But most lenses would be relatively 
thin, the lenses that we're interested in. And so this would be a good approximation. We can neglect this interior propagation. And so we can treat it as though it hits the first surface and then immediately hits the second surface. And so the effect of the entire lens is just the product of these two ray matrices. So we first hit the first surface, we have this matrix, and then we multiply it by the second matrix. So over on the far left, we've got the second matrix, one zero minus P two N, and then times the first matrix, one zero minus P one over N, 1 over n. And what is that equal to? First row inner product with the first column is just 1. First row inner product with the second column is 0. Second row inner product with the first column, let's see, well, here we'd have minus p2, and here we'd have n times minus p1 over n. So that's just minus p1 minus p2, or minus p1 plus P2. And then finally, the second column inner product with the second row, which would just be N times one over N would be one. So this has the form then of one zero minus P one, where P is P one plus P two is the power of the lens. And notice that this matrix here, which is the ray matrix for the lens, has a determinant of one. One times one minus zero times minus P. So now we have a description of an arbitrary spherical lens. First surface has a radius of curvature R1, second surface radius of curvature R2. The lens is made of material with index of refraction N, and it's embedded in air which ha or free space, which has an index essentially of one. The lens power we just showed is P is equal to the sum of the powers of the two surfaces, P1 plus P2, and that is equal to n minus 1 over r1 plus 1 minus n over r2, which can be rewritten by factoring out an n minus 1. So you'd have n minus 1 times 1 over r1, and then 1 minus n is minus n minus 1, so then the second term would be minus 1 over r2. And so for the type of lens that we've sketched here, um, we've been sketching lenses like this where, where the two surfaces are both um, convex, uh, but they wouldn't necessarily have to be that way. In other words, R1 and R2, either of them could be positive or negative. But for the lens we've shown here, this type, which would be called biconvex, so that R1 is positive and R2 is negative, well then this would be a positive minus a negative, so it'd be really the sum of two positive numbers, and that just is another way to say that both surfaces have positive power. They both would tend to bend a ray down toward the optical axis. And again, we're using the thin lens approximation where we neglect actually this propagation inside the lens. So what are the units of lens power? Well, index of refraction is dimensionless and radius of curvature would have units of meters so this has units of inverse meters meters to the minus one and we define one diopter to be one inverse meter so diopters are the units of lens power so if you ever got a prescription for eyeglasses um, that prescription is probably in terms of diopters, power that are uh, put into your eyeglasses to correct for lack of power or too much power in your eyes. And so our matrix for this system, we said, looks like this, 1, 0, minus P, 1. And the determinant of that would be 1 times 1 minus 0 is equal to 1. 
Now, with a thin lens approximation, we're, we're neglecting the thickness of a lens. If we take two lenses, so say we have a lens, this would be, uh, we could have a lens where one of the surfaces is flat. This would be called a plano convex lens. And then we could have another lens where, say, both surfaces have positive radius. This would be called a meniscus type lens. Eyeglasses usually have this form. And I've drawn these as if they're pretty, pretty thick, but imagine they're very, very thin and they're stuck right next to each other. And this one has power P1 and this has power P2. If I put two lenses together, what do I get? Well, the first of a ray comes in, it first strikes lens P1, which has ray matrix 1, 0, minus P1, 1. And then it strikes lens P2, which has a matrix 1, 0, minus P2, 1. And if you take the product of those, first row, first column, that's one. First row, first, uh, second column, that's zero. Um, second row, inner product with first column, that's minus P1 minus P2. So minus P1 plus P2. And then second row, inner product with the second column is one. So this is a zero here and one. And that looks like a, a single lens. with a power P that is the sum of the powers of the two lenses. And that's the principle on which eyeglasses function. Effectively, when you put your eyeglasses on, if you wear them, uh, your eyeglasses are close enough to the lens of your eyeball that, that approximately this formula applies and the power of your eyeglasses add into the power of your eyes lens. And so if you don't have, if you're someone older like me, who doesn't have enough power to see up close, um, we'll talk about the models for the eye later, um, then I need to have, for reading glasses, I need to have a positive power lens that adds to the limited power of my eyeball so that I can have sufficient lens power, effective lens power, to be able to read up close. In the appendix of lecture one is a printout of some Scilab code to perform ray tracing. And then there are two ray tracing programs that are also you can download as a zip file in the same place uh, that you find the PDF lecture notes. And these are called respectively ray trace AP for approximate ray tracing and ray tra trace EX for exact ray tracing. So the approximate ray tracing does the kinds of ray tracing calculations we will do with pencil and paper. That's the linear approximation, the small angle approximation. Whereas the exact ray tracing does all those nasty equations with the inverse signs and stuff, does it exactly on the computer. So the way this is set up is that you first have a listing of the lenses in your system. So this is a one lens system. So each lens, you give it the Z coordinates, location on the optical axis the aperture, and all distances are in millimeters here, uh, the aperture, the radius of the lens, and then the focal length. The focal length, as we'll see in the next lecture, is the inverse of the power. So if you had a lens of power 10 diopters, the inverse of that would be one-tenth meter or 100 millimeters of focal length. We'll see why that's later. Then here you have a specification of the, the rays. You can have one ray, and then you just specify the the Z, the X location, and the theta angle in degrees. So you could have a single ray or you could make some arrays like this to have multiple rays. And then finally, the Z coordinate of the output plane, the, the last Z position, in this case, is going to be 250 millimeters. So let's see what this does. So here's uh, the output. This is the lens, and the thin lens approximation is just a plane. Here are these parallel rays coming in, and they strike the lens, and then they're bent, and you see that the uh, rays are bent more the larger the x coordinate is right because the theta looks like theta one minus the power times x is theta two and then they all come to focus here in the we call the back focal plane of this lens this has a hundred millimeter focal length so from the lens position at z is equal to 100 we go another 100 and we go to 200 and all those rays come to focus that's going to, we'll see, that's the definition of the, the focal length. 
And they come to focus exactly because this is the approximation under which all of our ray tracing bookkeeping works out exactly. Now here's the same system in the program that does the exact ray tracing. So in this case, you've got to give the thickness of the lens in millimeters, its, its uh, radius or aperture, and the radii of curvature of the front and back surface. And so here the back surface has a negative radius of curvature and the index of refraction of the material. So let's run that and see what we get. So here we got a finite lens and you can see here, so it you know, comes to a point basically at the at its two ends. Um, let's just rerun that. But now notice over here at where we would expect, and you can work out what the power of this lens should be. It should be 10 diopters. So it should have a focal length of 100 millimeters. Um, that should bring everything to focus at 200 millimeters here. But if you zoom in, you can see uh, there's kind of a big mess there. Never really focuses. So let's uh, actually make these rays spread out across less of the lens aperture. And you notice now they're coming more to focus, although still not perfectly to focus. But when we have rays spread out over the entire aperture, they don't come perfectly to focus. And this is called an aberration. And it's due to the fact that this system is doing the exact ray tracing. It's not making those small angle approximations. And when you take into account the exact angles, things don't exactly come to focus. We'll study this in a lecture on, on aberrations. Okay, so that's just some uh, ray tracing. We could put, you know, we can put other, other lenses like, so let's say we put another lens here uh, at 120 with the same uh, parameters. So now we got one lens and then another lens and it comes to focus much sooner than it would be. Or what if we had a second lens with a negative focal length? It would be a negative power. We'll talk more about this in the next lecture. Well, in that case, you see what happens here. The lens, the rays come in, they bend toward the optical axis, and then they're bent away from the optical axis by the second lens. Uh, we could give it a little more. Right. Negative power, maybe even some more, right? And you can make then different types of combinations of lenses, or maybe we could do less negative power, you know, and, and so on. Um, and so we can build up systems which have an arbitrary number of lenses separated by propagation in between them. And from what we've already talked about, we know that this entire system, no matter how, you know, I can put 10 lenses in here if I want. Um, let's just put in another lens here, right? So this entire system from input to output will be described by a single two by two ABCD matrix, ray matrix, the entire system. And that's the beauty of our bookkeeping technique. No matter how many lenses I have in here, uh, how many propagations, how long the optical system is, the entire system from input to output is defined in terms of just four numbers, A, B, C, and D. And in fact, because the determinant of that matrix has to be one, A times D minus B times C, only three of the numbers are independent. So really three numbers fully specify an arbitrary optical system, at least one that is a so-called centered system like this where we have an optical axis and the lenses are centered on the optical axis.